Hi, I'm Lightning, otherwise known as Frederick Least. And I'm here to give you the story behind a very well-known map. It's been referred to as the ghost map, not, of course, by the person who produced it. How many of you have seen this book or read it? Now, cholera is an absolutely terrible way to die. <clears throat> the, uh, there are many stories about people who talked to somebody in the morning who seemed perfectly healthy and read in the evening that the same person had died. The, uh, these days, we know how to treat it. If you give people water, and electrolytes, almost nobody dies. At this time, not everybody showed symptoms, but if you showed symptoms, you had about a 50-50 chance. <clears throat> Whether it was really the most terrifying epidemic ever to strike London could be disputed with the plague of 1665 to 1666. And there was, in fact, a cholera epidemic six years before this one which killed far more people in London than this one did. And I'll leave it up to you after my talk to decide if this really did change <coughs> science, science. <laughs> cities, <laughs> and, the, and the future. <laughs> now, our protagonist is Dr. Jon Snow, who did, who did know something. <laughs> he was an obstetrician. He was a very early epidemiologist. <laughs> he was also the anesthetist to Queen Victoria. So, not inconsiderable. And he did know something, clearly. <laughs> In American English, we would call that an anesthesiologist. And his contemporaries considered him somewhat of a crank on the subject of cholera. Everybody knew that cholera was caused by miasma. <laughs> he had a theory that it was transmitted through water, infected water that came from people who already had it. Now, nobody believed that. The general response to his <coughs> little writings on cholera was, Jon Snow, you know nothing. <laughs> now, the time that we're speaking of was the third pandemic of cholera. There were five pandemics in the 19th century. You could think of this as an early gift, an early case of the Empire Strikes Back. And cholera spread from India back to England. The uh, reservoir of cholera is the Ganges River Delta, basically lowland Bangladesh these days, conveniently located below the S and the I of Asia in this medal which was struck by the Epidemiological Society of London, of which Dr. John Snow was an early member. <clears throat> now, here's a plague doctor. You can see that the conventionally accepted theory of disease transmission was still miasma. Nothing had changed in hundreds of years from that respect. This was still maybe a dozen years before Pasteur came up with the germ theory of disease. The, this is why we have a disease that is called bad air, mal aria. Population of London at this time was over two million. There were no sewers. Drinking water came from the Thames. The Thames River was full of what should have gone into the sewers. <clears throat> this was a time when you could literally, if you will pardon my French, <laughs> eat shit and die. <laughs> now, Dr. Farr had a theory, a hypothesis, that the higher up you lived above the Thames, the better chance you had of surviving. And he plotted out the expected mortality correlated it to the actual mortality. It was a very good fit. He saw absolutely no reason not to persist with the miasma theory. Pseudoscience! 
Now, Dr. Snow was presented with a double-blind experiment. It just fell into his lap. There were two competing water companies that supplied water in the south of London. In 1849, when he wrote his first monograph, both of them took water from the, basically the tide line in the Thames. Needless to say, it was heavily polluted. By this time, one of them had moved their intake to a place above where <coughs> the sewage ran in. But the uh, Southwark and Vauxhall company did not. They were still taking it straight out of the tidal Thames. So Dr. Snow went door to door and asked people, where do you get your water from? Then he asked about cholera cases. What he found was an extremely strong correlation between people who got their water from Southwark and Vauxhall and people who died of cholera. Meanwhile, the Board of Health were busy looking for the sources of miasma. <clears throat> so you can see the gentleman on his knees in the foreground has his nose in what they called a gully hole that we would refer to as a, uh, as a storm drain. Somebody else is investigating a place where they sell cat's meat, which I was very happy to find was meat for cats, <laughs> not from cats. <laughs> And in, in general, somebody in the background is saying, we can't justify our salary if we can't find something here. <laughs> Not everybody agreed that they were actually earning their salary, but they were certainly living well, the Board of Health. So the generally accepted theory was that the lower orders enjoyed living in filth. They deserved what they got. I was very disappointed to find out that Florence Nightingale herself thought that. And should be needless to say that the poor didn't agree with that. I'm not going to attempt a Cockney accent. I wouldn't be able to do it well. <laughs> we live in muck and filth. We ain't got no privies, nor dustbins, no drains, no water supplies. The stench of a gully hole is disgusting. We all of us suffer, and numbers are ill, and if the cholera comes, Lord help us. We are living like pigs, and it ain't fair we should be so ill-treated. Meanwhile, the rich go by holding their noses. Now, nobody thought that Thames water was especially good, and this particular cartoon is called Monster Soup. At the same time, nobody was very much concerned that sewage went straight into the Thames, and people drank that, because they were convinced that miasma was the cause of cholera, and the uh, little matter of drinking water that had already passed through other people just had nothing to do with it. There was an epidemic, a local epidemic, in John Snow's own neighborhood. The population was literally decimated. Decimated is one of those words that is almost never used correctly. But there was 10% mortality in eight days. The, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Snow already had his theory that the transmission was caused by polluted water. And he went and talked to people. He noticed that the mortality was highest next to the Broad Street pump. Nobody wanted to hear that. The Broad Street pump was famous for the good quality and good taste of its water. <clears throat> Dr. Snow had some local help. Now, Father Henry Whitehead was young at the time, but didn't get his portrait taken until about 30 years later when he looks like he was rejected from the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so Dr. or Father Whitehead was initially skeptical of the theory, but came around eventually. He helped Dr. Snow track down the index case, who was an infant at number 40 Broad Street. It turned out that, of course, since there were no sewers, people had cesspits. The cesspit at 40 Broad Street was three feet from the cistern for the Broad Street pump. When they literally dug into it, 
they found the brickwork on both of them leaked. So anything that went into the cesspit went into the cistern. On the 7th of September, 1854, eighth day of the epidemic, Dr. Snow persuaded the Board of Guardians of St. James's Parish to remove the pump handle of the Broad Street pump. No one on the Board of Guardians actually believed that cholera was waterborne, but they were desperate. They removed the pump handle, the local epidemic stopped. Dr. Snow himself said, this could have been a coincidence because everybody who could left. And so the epidemic was dying down anyway. But Father Whitehead pointed out that the father of the infant, who was the index case, came down with cholera on the morning of the 8th of September. If the pump handle was still there, the epidemic would have restarted. Now, Dr. Snow did not come up with the first map of the epidemic. This was done by the uh, commissioners of the board of sewers, where sewers really meant storm drains, not what we think of as sewers now. And it was designed to show that there was no correlation between the storm drains and cholera mortality. Dr. Snow's second map has an irregular polygon around it that shows the limits of the areas that were closer to the Broad Street pump than to any other pump. There were a few anomalies to explain. 500 people lived in the workhouse. There should have been 50 fatalities, but they had their own water supply. They weren't drinking from the Broad Street pump. There was a brewery that employed 70 people, not a single fatality. They weren't drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> now, Father Whitehead came up with his own map. What's interesting there is the dark gray is a field where many of the plague victims from 1665 were buried. <coughs> the uh, limit of the field stops four doors from the Broad Street pump. There were a lot of people convinced that it was miasma coming from the rotting bodies of the plague victims that actually caused the cholera epidemic. Dr. Snow presented his map to the Board of Health. They looked at it. They said, John Snow, you know nothing. <laughs> it's perfectly obvious that the source of the epidemic was miasma, and all this waterborne stuff is nonsense. <laughs> so 12 years later, there was another epidemic by this time, the city of London was doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. They were putting in sewer lines and they were separating sewage from drinking water, not because they thought that diseases were waterborne, but just because it was kind of gross to think about otherwise. <laughs> in 1866, there was only one part of the city of London that was affected by cholera. And that was a part that sewer lines hadn't yet reached even Dr. Farr, if you remember the gnomish-looking guy from early on, agreed that cholera was waterborne. This was too late for Dr. Snow. He died young of a stroke eight years before this happened. Now, at the time, there was an Italian anatomist named Filippo Pacini who actually observed the cholera bacterium and because he published in Italian, and because nobody knew who he was, even though he identified the cholera bacterium, nobody read it, nobody believed it, nobody thought about it until 30 years later when, when a more popular <laughs> researcher named Robert Koch re-identified the cholera bacterium. Edward Tufte, who's famous for the visual depiction of data, twice wrote about Dr. Snow's map. <clears throat> the first time, it wasn't Dr. Snow's map at all. It was a 1950s excerpt that lost a lot of information and was therefore misleading. The second time, he actually quoted the real map. <clears throat> 
He also visited a pub, which is located conveniently close to where the Broad Street Thump used to be. Ironic in a way, since Dr. Snow himself had been teetotal for most of his life. While there, he was shown the so-called original pump handle. If you look at the original pump handle and the replica of the pump, you can tell that handle was not pumping anything out of there. <laughs> Turned out to be a quarter-size replica made by an American university, but the barman was passing it off as original. <laughs> anyway, here's to knowing something, sticking to your guns, even when no one believes you. Cheers. Yeah.